you know, it's interesting. I, as as we talk, there's a common theme that I hear, and and I wonder if you even realize it. In this, don't be afraid to. And I wonder how much that really come back to your youthful experience of just knocking on doors uh, and learning not to be afraid. It, it takes a while to do that because, especially early on in your career, the, the thing you most worry about is don't make mistakes because you're you're new. People are judging you, and it's tough to be able. It's easy to sit here and say, "Oh, be don't be afraid. Go." Roll the dice, you know, be aggressive. And you're sitting there and you're brand new in a company, you're trying to raise money, or you've got a team and, and you're, it's your first job, whatever it is, you know, it's, it is tough to be able to have that mindset. Um, and so I think it's, it's all about communicating and being uh, confident and being fact-based. Hello and welcome to Million Dollar Monday. I'm your host, Greg Mazzello, bringing you real successful people with real useful advice for people with big dreams. Now, I understand big dreams. I turned an investment of $200 and a lot of great advice from some really successful people into my big dream, Proforma, that today is a half billion dollar company. have a very interesting guest today, somebody with great experience, both as an entrepreneur and a CEO of very large uh, corporations uh, around the world. He has success in bringing not just one, but three companies public. And he has a wealth of experience as an expert in sales, operations, finance, brand building, and international expertise. Welcome, John Shepard. John, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Greg. Great to be here. Yeah, I love I love your background. I love your story. I love all of your experiences as we have known each other over the years. Do me a favor. And let's start at the beginning a little a little bit about your growing up years, your educational background and what led you to be involved in the world of business and to grow your success in that world. Sure. Uh, basically grew up in Washington, D.C. area, um, five kids in the family and um, Started, lived there until about uh, 13 years old and moved to Atlanta, but um, started working really early and uh, at about 13, having five kids in the family and realizing I was going to have to put myself through college. I went ahead and started working at Fuller Brush, knocking on doors. Mm -hmm. And it was a, it was quite an experience as a shy, skinny 13 year old kid to go out and start knocking on doors. And but it really taught me the importance of, of communication and connecting with people and, and hard work. Those are things that really mattered to me. And then went to University of Georgia and got my undergraduate degree and then uh, started getting my JD MBA and then switched to just getting my MBA. And so I got my MBA in finance um, back in uh, many years ago, more than I'd like to admit. And then went from that into the business world and started at Coca-Cola. Yeah. By the way, uh, speaking, you're the first person I've chatted with that has fuller brush experience, but I've talked <laughs> to many folks who have door-to-door -door sales experience of other products, including vacuum cleaners and encyclopedias. And I find, I find those people to be very tenacious and very successful <laughs> in everything they do because they just don't know fear, right? Right, right. Yeah. It was it's right. a great way to get over your fears if you had any. Abs absolutely. All right. Talk to us a little, little bit about your years at Coke. What, what an admirable company, what a great brand. And tell us about your experience there. Yeah, well, actually, I was at graduate school and saw an ad in a newspaper. It was sitting in the graduate lounge for somebody who, at Coca-Cola, which is a company I always wanted to get into, growing up in Atlanta for most of my life, that was a company I wanted to work at. And it, had, it was for an area that I knew nothing about, um, but I decided to go and spend the weekend. I, I, entered, I sent in my resume changed it to say that I was really proficient at this software language that they wanted, uh, ended up getting the job. So then uh, when I went in to start work, I had to spend a week or so before that figuring out how this, how this software worked. So I worked at Coke for a total of 19 years and, uh, at, and did everything from uh, starting finance mostly, and then moved into M&A work, did all the mergers and acquisitions for Coke for about five or six years, helped take Coca-Cola Enterprise public. And then decided I, after doing that for two or three years, I really wanted to get into operations. So I went to the company and said, I wanna, I wanna eventually become a CEO. So I wanna get into, I wanna run something, help me do that. 
so they sent me overseas and sent me to Eastern Europe. And so uh, that's I went overseas and spent uh, about 12 years overseas in various roles, running different parts of Coca-Cola finance, and then finally got a chance to run an operational role in Poland. So after I looked on a map, found out where Poland was, I got on a plane and moved there on Valentine's Day in the middle of winter and uh, and and became it was one of the best jobs I ever had was Coca-Cola Poland. And, wow. Uh, so it was fun. Yeah. Amazing. All right. So through your years, what followed uh, after these great years with Coca-Cola? I um, So after my role as president of Coca-Cola Poland, I started moving up the ladder a bit and ran Coca-Cola Eastern Europe and then all of Coca-Cola Europe. And so I did that for until when I finally left, um, my, protege, my, my mentor, I should say, and CEO left the company. I left about the same time he did. It was a good time to leave. They were bringing all the expats back. And I realized, Greg, at that point that I had a great resume, but I didn't have what I considered the entrepreneurial work spirit and, and knowledge of running a company. Um, mm -hmm. Coke, you know, you were running a big division, but things like payroll, cash flow, all those things, you know, you worked for Coke, you know, somebody else did all right. that stuff. Right. So I went and, and, and went and talked to a friend of mine who uh, used to work at Coke. And, and she said, you know, there's a great small startup company called Service Central Technologies. They sell software, which I knew nothing about. And I ended up going in there and learning about software, learning about everything from how to, you know, how to, how to really run a company and became president CEO of that and, and did a great, you know, loved that for a few years. And then unfortunately, the, uh, the, 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 the claws of the recruiters got me to come back into the uh, corporate world. And I started running some more uh, large companies like Cot Beverages and, and a few others to get back into the, to the business world. Tell our listeners, because I think many people might, many people probably know COT, but they might not hmm. know the brand COT. Tell us a little bit more yeah. about COT. Yeah, COT Beverages is actually the uh, large, the world's largest maker of private label soft drinks. When you go into Publix and you see the Publix brand of cola or Walmart, Sam's Choice, um, all those, pretty much we had about a 95% share in the U.S. of all private label soft drinks. So for a, for a person who bled, you know, red Coca-Cola to go from them to the enemy of private label was tough. But because I had experience and, and, and customer relationship skills, you know, go, coming in to take the CEO role of COT was, was, was really fun. And uh, that did that uh, for about five or six years, became CEO pretty quickly. And that was my first uh, CEO role of a public company, which is something I had always wanted to do. And, and that brought out its own set of challenges. Yeah. Fascinating. And I, and, and I think uh, I remember when I heard your story originally, I remember thinking, I never heard of cotton. And then when you told me who they really were, I thought, oh my goodness, because they do go You've to market. Them. They do go to market sometimes under the cotton name geographically, I think, but uh, I had no clue how large they really were. Yeah. They used to be uh, in the Northeast. If you knew the cot brand, you're probably from the Northeast because that's where cot uh, it's caught to be good was their slogan and it was uh -huh. up in the Northeast and, uh, and, but over the years it became primarily a private label company. And yeah. So, great company though. That's All what got right. me to Tampa. So, okay. So you got to Tampa, then what followed your, your time with cot? I started working for a number of other small companies. Um, I did some, you know, consulting work. I started a consulting firm here. Um, I then started working though, Greg, with private equity. Uh, and started doing for the next probably five years, I worked for a number of small and very large private equity firms from a small one in, in New York, you might have heard of called um, Emigrant Capital, Emigrant Bank in New York, um, and then ended up going to Advent International, worked for Catterton Partners, and did a number of other small, uh, uh, large, sorry, uh, private equity roles where I came in as a as an operating partner or hire for gun CEO. And I would come in and do due diligence on companies they were going to acquire. And if they acquired it, they would ask me to come in and run that as CEO. And so it was a really cool sort of feeder system there. So for our listeners who are aspiring entrepreneurs, which is really what this uh, uh, Million Dollar Monday is targeted to, giving great advice to aspiring entrepreneurs and people with big dreams, as a person who helped raise money and find money uh, for entrepreneurial ventures, um, and, and then came in even, even as a CEO, 
What advice would you have for folks who somewhere think they want to raise money either privately or publicly? Well, first, I would say if you're a, an entrepreneur and you're trying to raise money, um, I think the, the key for that is really being able to communicate effectively your mission, your value, and your strengths, and also your weaknesses. I think a, anybody who is on the, on the financial side of it, coming in to look at raising, giving money to an entrepreneur, knows that there are weaknesses. And so the key yeah. thing I found is, as an entrepreneur, be upfront, be honest, uh, but be able to talk through what the challenges you've had and are, and, and are likely to have going forward. Because at that point, as the, as the money guy, you see what, uh, what challenges are there and how this person thinks and how they're going to approach what are naturally going to be uh, bumps in the road going forward. Um, the best thing, uh, the second part of that I would say is, is building a great team. If you're raising money, um, having a great team and how to, you know, not just hiring a good team, but, but developing them. And that's the first thing I always look at if I'm either investing in, and I do some of that now with some small entrepreneurial companies, um, but I look and talk to the team. I want to talk to not the person who's raising the money necessarily, but the, the team beneath that, the CFO, the head of sale. Um, and then the, the final one would be, uh, don't be afraid to fail when you're communicating. Don't be afraid to take risks and, and talk about the risk you've taken and the calculated risk you've taken and how you've been innovative to help uh, uh, you know, sort of differentiate yourself. And that's kind of the key word I took away was differentiation. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, as, as we talk, there's a common theme that I hear. And, and I wonder if you even realize it in this, don't be afraid to, uh, don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to tell somebody you can do software and put it on your resume. Cause you know, that's what they're looking for, even though you don't <laughs> know how to do it. And I wonder how much that really come back to your youthful experience of just knocking on doors uh, and learning not to be afraid, uh, but it right. is a wonder. It really, truly is a wonderful lesson um, to not be afraid. Yeah, it's been it's been something that it, it takes a while to do that because, especially early on in your career, the, the thing you most worry about is don't make mistakes because you're you're new. People are judging you, and it's tough to be able. It's easy to sit here and say, "Oh, be don't be afraid. Go roll the dice. You know, be aggressive." And you're sitting there and you're brand new in a company, you're trying to raise money or you've got a team and, and you're, it's your first job, whatever it is, you know, it's, it is tough to be able to have that mindset. Um, and so I think it's, it's about communicating and being uh, confident and being fact-based. Yeah. It's also, you know, I'm sure when you were standing at those doors, uh, you know, I did the same thing, you know, and to get in, in, in school, we had to go sell, I can't think of the name of that chocolate bar. We'd oh have, Yeah. I can't think great American chocolate bar or something like that. Yeah, it was really good chocolate. Well, you know, we would go, to, you know, we don't do that anymore today, but you know, nope. at some point when you're standing at that door, you got to realize, is this person going to be a buyer or not? And you got to figure out when it's time to yep. either continue talking or cut and run. Yep. Right. And, and that's it's right. the same in business. Uh, when do I continue pursuing whatever the strategy is or when mm -hmm. is it time to sort of cut and run? Absolutely. You know, I used to call it sort of emotional intelligence, too, is when you're there's two sides that is deal when you're dealing with someone, whether you're selling them and, you know, being able to figure out, you know, what's the right way to connect to them. And I've I've run into entrepreneurs before who have sort of a one way of communicating. And it's sort of no matter who they're talking to, whether it's just this is how I communicate, this is how I deal with people. And I found that to be a failed strategy many times, because if you can't connect and, and, and see sort of what makes the other person tick, what's what's on their mind, how to, how to best address what you think their concerns are. And there are visual cues and non-visual cues to do that. But being able to have that strong emotional intelligence to be able to adjust on the fly is also really important. Because if you go in with a, I'm just going to talk about these five things, um, and I can tell you horror story after horror story about salespeople who go in and, and don't see that and, and aren't able to sell at that point. Right, 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 yeah. You know, as a younger guy, I started Proform when I was 23. Uh, I thought everybody thought like I did, and it took me a while to really understand not everybody does. Some people are, they can make a decision on the spot. Some people really need a little time uh, to stop and think about things. And some people, when they actually say, can I think about that and get back to you, even though I believe many times buyers are liars, right? You got to, you got to figure out, is that person really somebody that's very process oriented and really does need mm -hmm. the time? And if they do, then how do you ask the right questions to make sure that you're back in the selling situation when they're ready to make the decision? You're, you're absolutely right, though. There are many different types of personalities. There's lots of different types of personality tests. And 
And eventually I got exposed to some of that stuff and began to really appreciate the various kind of backgrounds of not only buyers and user customers, but also employees, because there's different ways, right, Absolutely. of managing employees who come at work with a different perspective. Yeah, you know, speaking of that, I mean, one of the big things that I found, you know, back to the entrepreneur thing for a minute, um, is, you know, is people have asked me sort of, you know, how do you become a, you know, the, the classic, oh, how did you become a good leader or whatever? And the reality is, I was a terrible leader for many years at Coca-Cola. <laughs> And it wasn't until the company decided to invest in me and do this, what's called 360 feedback. And I don't, you've probably been through it or you probably put your employees through it. It was the, both the worst and best experience of my life because what it did is it, it explained, it sort of, it interviews people at your, you know, you, who you report to, who report to you, your cohorts, all around. So 360 degree. And the, the feedback I got when I was a young up and coming, you know, rising star at Coke was, very smart, very aggressive guy, but, you know, terrible leader, but we follow him because we fear him. He's, he's, he's crazy. He's, he, you know, he's angry, you know, and, and people, I found that I was a good boss, effective boss, I should say, because I got results, but I wasn't a good leader. And until I could get people to follow me because they respected me and, and, and viewed me as a, as a real leader versus somebody who just feared me, I didn't become, I wasn't able to then become, take that next step as an entrepreneur or as a leader. So I, I know that you're today, you continue to run successful companies. And it also sounds like you do uh, angel investing. Uh, is that right? Yes. I also, I do some angel investing. I've done uh, some this year. I also uh, teach at University of Tampa to the entrepreneurship class. And uh, for once, you know, a, a, a class there on entrepreneurship and then also on foundations of management. So I just... Uh, it's not on my, I haven't updated my LinkedIn or anything on that, but I've been doing that for two semesters now. And I love that. It's that sort of the next step in my career as I, you know, fade away uh, to try to figure out a way to get this to the next level and, and, and impart some of this wisdom on others. Um, but yeah, I do some angel investing too, though. Well, that's exactly why I do Million Dollar Monday. I, so many people were very gracious with me in their time and give me great advice that helped shape me and help shape our company that I love doing what I'm doing now, talking with people like you, and hopefully aspiring entrepreneurs uh, can listen and, and get some great advice that can be helpful to them. All right. So what, what do you see now as an angel investor, right? Because there's a difference being with a large venture capital company mm -hmm. and more early stage, which is, I think, maybe where a lot more of my listeners might be. What kind of advice do you have and what do you look for in a first round of funding or an early round of funding as an angel investor? What I'm looking for, two main things is, what, is there an innovative product that, that is there? Is there something that differentiates this from somebody else right. down the street? And you know, what, 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 what causes you as an entrepreneur, as a company or as a product to be different than something I could find on, on Amazon or, or somewhere else? And then the second thing is you as, if I'm investing in a company, I'm investing at least as much in the person and the team. Yes. And it's, it's as I'm trying to sit there, I'm not, as, you know, I'm doing due diligence on the product and profitability and those things, but I'm really trying to figure out what makes this CEO or leader tick here. What is, yeah. is this the type of person who can be successful? And, you know, a lot of times I find great products, but you know, I, I, I don't invest because yeah. I don't see the, uh, the, the, the follow through there on the CEO side. So I'm looking for both of those things, differentiation and, and good leadership. Right, right, right. Yeah. A lot of wis a lot of wisdom in that. And then finally, John is a person who has had great success helping take three companies public, having successfully been an entrepreneur, now an angel investor and very successful and well rewarded in the corporate world. Now that you've been this successful, what are the big dreams you have for the rest of your life? Um, wow, that's a good one. I'd say, you know, short term, it's uh, I, I really like what we've started at Otlight. We created a company that went, moved it from the, the, the 80 year old buyer at Joanne's Fabric. That was our that was our craft lamp to health and wellness. We created the only uh, sanitizing desk lamp on the market. We're coming out with a brand new one that's going to kill viruses in about uh, three or four months. And then, um, so seeing this through, it's probably one of the most exciting, it, it's allowed me to bring all my skills over the last 40 years yeah. into a company and be able to really manage that. So my sh sort of mid, mid to short-term to midterm goal is to get this company 
get it uh, to the next level and then uh, probably uh, uh, have a successful exit. And, and then, yeah, it would be to probably go and continue teaching and yeah. angel investing and doing, uh, you know, uh, uh, finding ways that I can contribute back, whether it's financially, but more importantly, even the, 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 uh, the advice and leadership side of it to either students or young entrepreneurs. So let yeah, uh, you and I are kind of both tracking similarly there. But before we close out here, tell us a little bit about Otlight because you mentioned it now. So so tell oh, us sure. what it is. Yeah, yeah we're, a, we're a lighting company, desk lamps, table lamps. Primarily uh, five years ago when I joined, we were in craft like Michael's and Joanne's Fabric and a little bit in Costco. Uh, and so when I came in as CEO, it's a Tampa-based company, which is exciting to me as I looked at this. It's a smaller company that I'm used to running, but it was because it was such a unique product, uh, that, or a product that I thought was underdeveloped. It had a great brand name but really a small reach, a very narrow focus. So for a couple of years, I did nothing but innovate. I went to China, I went to factories uh, and, and talked to them about what can we do different? What can we do in, in a desk lamp that sets us apart? And so about a year and a half ago before COVID, um, sitting down and my wife actually came up with the idea and said, why don't you, you know, create a lamp like they have in these hospitals that kills you know, things in rooms? I said, well, we can't do that because that's an ultraviolet light, it's bad for your eyes. But I did some research and found there's a specific la- uh, um, range of light that kills germs and bacteria on your desk, but it's safe for your eyes and actually is really good for your eyes. It reduces eye strain. We patented that, created a desk lamp for it. Wal- got on the phone. Uh, we couldn't get in to see Walmart. And I uh, called the CEO of Walmart and he said, you know what? We, want it. We, we think this is the greatest thing we've seen in 40 years. His team did. And we're now launching this week in all Walmarts nationwide. So that's the type of thing that's, you know, that, that has started to set Otlight apart from yep, just yep. craft to now health and wellness. Yep, Sorry yep, for the yep. long answer, but it's a, no, it's, it's, a, exciting it's, a, it's a great answer. And I still come back to those early experiences that you had that taught you to knock on the door, make the phone call, because here you are even today benefiting from that experience, picking up the phone and calling the CEO of Walmart. Why not? Right. Exactly. You know, you get, as you said, from whether you're at knocking on doors uh, as selling Fuller Brush, there's barriers there and you have to, you know, and, and you're going to find barriers in every job you go through. The key is how do you address those? And, the, you know, you could walk away and just say, damn, they didn't, they didn't want this. But I've always learned, and I try to teach this to my team, don't give up. And, you know, if you, if you run into a roadblock, use me, I'll help you. Yeah, I'm pretty insistent on the, the fact that no, 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 never means no. And you know, right. This, right? no doesn't mean no, no means maybe until you hear no about seven to 12 times. Right, right. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, John, it's really been fun visiting with you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. And thank you for now what you're doing, the angel investing that you're doing, the teaching uh, in the university environment. You're making our world and our entrepreneurial world a better place. Well, thank you, Greg. Thanks for the opportunity and I appreciate uh, the time spent with you.